for, uh, for coming to hear a little bit about um, the program that I'm calling A Meditation on a Theme by Thomas Tallis, um, named after the, the uh, Vaughan Williams uh, Fantasia on a Theme by Thomas Tallis. Um, I took that as an inspiration um, when some of my students were rehearsing uh, Tallis's If Ye Love Me, Keep My Commandments and I Will Pray the Comforter. And we got into a point in that, um, in singing that motet, uh, where we were walking around the modern languages uh, lecture hall. And at a certain point, some of the students were outside of the door singing, If Ye Love Me. Um, and, and we were singing this um, incredible polyphony uh, while people looked at us as if we had lost our minds in the hallway outside. But for me, it was a magical musical moment. Um, and I found um, in their sound an investment in the piece that uh, up until then um, we hadn't seen the likes of uh, in the other pieces that we were rehearsing. So I've centered the concert around um, If Ye Love Me, um, Thomas Tallis's piece. Um, and what you'll see is uh, the program is divided into several sets. The first is called, of course, If Ye Love Me, and that includes um, uh, and so it goes and the five Hebrew love songs of Eric Whitaker. I'll sing, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And the choir will join me in aleatory, keep my commandments, keep my commandments, keep my commandments. We'll all sing together. And that will lead us into Benjamin Britten's Rejoice in the Lamb. And it goes on and on and on until we finally get through the first line, if ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. So as we go through um, the program, um, I'd like to offer a little bit of, um, of explanation about some of these pieces, a little bit of the history and the story about the things that you're about to hear. If You Love Me, born um, during the reign of Henry VII, the first of the Tudors to rule the English kingdom, Thomas Tallis would live through the reign of four Tudor monarchs and well into the reign of a fifth. Tallis would come to serve four of them as court composer and musician. Henry VIII, known for abruptly replacing the religious rule of the Catholic Church and founding the Church of England. Edward, a Protestant like his father, and who reigned from the age of nine until his death six years later. Mary, known for her staunch Catholicism. She's also known as Bloody Mary in history. Um, and for the mass executions of those who stood in her way on the path to replacing Rome's role in England. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, the Protestant sister of Mary, whose lengthy reign was known for an explosion of cultural and scientific discovery, a so-called golden era. Tallis's compositions then offer a remarkable look into the winding shifts of religious thought in England's Renaissance and into the musical changes that necessarily accompanied them. If You Love Me shows Tallis, uh, shows Tallis in the reign of Edward I, still at the very nascent of the, uh, of the Anglican anthem. The, Re the Regency Council, which essentially managed the kingdom in the young Ed Edward's stead, had issued a decree mandating church music in the English language rather than Latin, set homophonically in the interest of intelligibility for congregants. So If Ye Love Me begins just this way, but soon departs into a form of imitative polyphony. Notably, this imitation is quite different from the thick polyphonic textures of, say, Delasso or Morenzio. Instead, a slowed pace of successive entrances and simple declamatory motive brings an intelligible polyphony, one that would free Talus from strict homophony while respecting the Regency Council's desires. The farthest deviation from the homophonic in this piece comes in the B section. That he may abide with you forever in the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth. Desire for intellig intelligibility may explain why Talus repeats this section and why the ABB form takes place, um, this piece takes, particularly where the most complex polyphony occurs in the B section, became widely used in Anglican anthem writing. Let's move on to the next larger piece in this, in this program, part of the love songs portion. In the spring of 1996, American composer Eric Whitaker and his future wife, soprano and poet Gila Plitman, sorry, visit the city of Speyer 
in the southeast of Germany. These five Hebrew love songs are written at the request of the friend who invited them. They're written in the spirit of the songs of the storied troubadours, the itinerant artists and performers of the European Middle Ages. In fact, over the course of the piece, Whitaker manages to evoke an entire band of ancient instruments and voices, from cathedral bells and tambourines, <coughs> excuse me, to faint drums and the very memory of voices. Intending them as a small collection of odes for his beloved, Whitaker sets his future wife's texts, delicate, deeply beautiful snapshots of their romance, capturing in each movement particular moments of their time together on the Rhine. The first, Temuna, begins the conversation between treble and bass voices, symbolically Eric and Hila, with a duet of soprano and alto. A picture is engraved in my heart, the text says, moving between light and darkness. A sort of silence envelops your body and your hair falls upon your face just so. Whitaker paints the intimacy of these words with a single melodic line permeating the entire movement. First, the violin, the soprano spin out a delicate dancing melody characterized for its dotted rhythms. The other instruments, piano and altos, maintain a wispy, slow-moving accompaniment, as if the trails of wind following her dancing feet, as if they twist and spin lazily about her, as if they modify her. Tenors and basses respond in a duet of their own, at first in chant-like unison, Kala, kala, kula, the piano and violin move even more slowly than in the previous movement, sounding larger, richer, more stable chords. A treble response follows in the form of a jaunty dance, also in unison. This strophic exchange continues as the duets gain more imitative, har harmonized versions of their melodies. Light bride, kala, kala. She is all mine, and lightly she will kiss me. The text's title in Hebrew is the pun kala, kala, spelled K-A-L-A and then K-A-L-L-A, which translated loosely means light bride. The movement ends when the full choir embraces the repeated light imagery in a brilliant dance reminiscent of the first movements. Eze Schelleg captures the exact pitches of the cathedral bells that greeted Eric and Hila each morning in uh, Spezer into a hazy aleatoric texture. The voices of the chorus intone the bells over which the violin plays sparse harmonics. Flashes of sunlight reflected out from a snow glistened earth. The piece progresses with exceeding patience, itself frozen in snow. Out of the bells and downy flake sounds a lone, simple melody sung by soprano soloist. Like the entire piece, Whitaker uses these textures to highlight an unceasing intimate vulnerability, a sense of a rare and bare romance. The piece ends with the faint sounds of drums from alto tenor and bass voices underneath a low soprano melody. The melody falls even farther down into the low alto range as the text depicts the woman as very hard to please. And as much, the text says, as she tried to stay thus, simply and with no good reason, he took into her into himself and set her down in the softest, softest place. In the early 20th century, the Reverend Canon Walter Hussey had established himself as a particularly eager patron of the art and of artists. His work at St. Matthew's Church, Northampton, and at Chichester, Chichester Cathedral, which is a mouthful, by the way. We have a piece called Chichester Psalms, which I can never get through five times fast. It's a thing to do. Uh, Northampton and at the Chichester Cathedral involved the commissioning of works from among the most celebrated composers of the time. These included Gerald Finzi and Leonard Bernstein and a cantata of Britain, Rejoice in the Lamb, which we'll perform for you tonight. 
Britain's work sets ex excerpts from Jubilate Anio, an epic religious poem of over 1,200 lines. Christopher Smart, the poem's writer, penned these verses between 1759 and 1763 when he was committed to St. Luke's Hospital for lunatics, possibly for religious fanaticism, and possibly in retribution to debts he had acquired. Largely isolated from the outside world now, and strongly maintaining his claim to be sane, he turned to poetry to express a persisting faith and a madness from being wrongly accused. Both aspects present themselves in Britain's setting of the text. The cantata comprises 10 short sections. First, a solemn chant based on a single C. Rejoice in God, O ye tongues, around which sparse organ chords punctuate the steady pitch. The C and the organ slowly grow to the text, magnify his name, which for the first time lifts the C chant to D flat and E flat. The action of magnifying has taken the voices to a musical realm just above the one that he had previously occupied for a brief, brief moment. The second movement calls prophets and stories uh, storied characters together from the Hebrew Bible to come forth with all manner of animals, beastly and small, in praise to God. Let Nimrod, the mighty hunter, bind a leopard to the altar and consecrate a spear to the Lord. Let Daniel come forth with a lion and bless the Lord his people. Let Ithamar minister with a chamois, which, by the way, looks kind of like um, a small goat and stays on um, the Western European mountain ranges and bless the name of him that clotheth the naked. Britain sets a, it as a pompous, eccentric dance centered around a repeating rhythmic cycle of seven beats, followed by seven beats, followed by six beats, followed by six beats, seven, seven, six, six. Britain deviates wildly and frequently from that rhythmic cycle, including measures that contain nine beats and 11 beats. He manages to conjure both a remarkable grandeur and a sense of complete instability, of mania. Following are three movements set very poignantly for solo voices. Three living beings are praised here, the cat, the mouse, and the flowers. The poetry describes each as a servant of God, perfect and content in its own life and its own service. The cat worships in his way, reading his body seven times round with elegant quickness. The mouse, despite his tiny stature, runs valiantly through the towering world around him. The flowers are great blessings. The flowers glorify God, and their root parries the adversary. Britain depicts the text most vividly through the organ, whose textures morph from the endlessly winding feline to the tiny persistent triplet hops of the mouse. Dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum. Still on to a lazy pastoral landscape where flowers stretch their faces toward the heavens. The heart of the piece is Britain's selection of what I, uh, of what I call the plight text. Here, Christopher Smart expresses his own thoughts on being trapped in an insane asylum. He says, for I am under the same accusation with my savior. For they said he is besides himself. For the officers of the peace are at variance with me and the watchman smites me with his staff. For silly fellow is against me and belongeth neither to me nor to my family. For I am of 12 hardships, but he that was born of a virgin shall deliver me from all. Such a conviction of faith leads to celebration as the poet calls out instruments with voices imitating the sounds of these instruments as they go by. The celebration settles to the moments of solace and smarts faith that told him they would come soon. For at that time malignity ceases and the devils themselves are at peace. For this time is perceptible to man by a remarkable stillness and serenity of soul. Hallelujah to the heart of God. 
We follow that with Babe Tandaza, a South African folk song. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. This text is, we are the way we are. Sin jen 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 me tandazo. Because of our mother's prayers, even our mothers had faith and prayed. Oh, mama bagu dala babe tandaza. Choose something like a star from Frostiana, in which we are admonished to find in the stars and in the heavens a place to be satisfied and to be stayed. God's gonna set this world on fire. The truths of the American slave labor system of the 18th and 19th centuries are filled with horrifying realities. Still, one reality of the slave labor system remains a most palpable contribution to our American culture. Even today, the music of African Americans enslaved brought about a remarkable convergence of work songs from the nations of West Africa and newly discovered Christian stories. From the first generations of these enslaved African workers, they brought with them a particular musical language of songs suited to the rhythmically repetitive field work to which they were subjected. The use of call and response, the relatively simple harmonic organization, the dominance of the pentatonic scale in melodic writing. Second, African Americans overwhelmingly responded to the Mosaic, Abrahamic, and Christian stories of the Bible, stories of perseverance, of justice, of new life. And so these West African work songs became thoroughly infused with the references to these narratives, to Moses espousing a persistent hope amid oppressive odds. They were no longer songs of labor, rather songs of the spirit. Moses Hogan's arrangement of God's gonna set this world on fire itself represents another remarkable convergence in American music. First, the pentatonically conceived melody. God's gonna set this world on fire. God's gonna set this world on fire one of these days, hallelujah. God's gonna set this world on fire. God's gonna set this world on fire one of these days. Only comprising five pitches in the scale. Those, uh, those in a duple meter, well matched to the rhythm of field work. And the text's allegorical references to the apocalypse found in the revelation of John show a clear presence of the defining features of a spiritual. Here, though, um, Hogan harmonizes the melody with parallel thirds, a strong characteristic of the gospel tradition, which was a fusion of jazz, blues, and black Christian praise that emerged not until the 1920s. Further, the addition of a fourth part, a bass part underneath, brings this genre into the realm, or at least the vocal range structure, of the European-based choral traditions. Even though he is not the first to rearrange the spiritual for the concert stage, that distinction lies in 1871 with the Fifth Jubilee Singers. Hogan is to be remembered for his remarkable creativity with the spiritual genre. Hogan's particularly evocative use of choral textures to paint vivid biblical scenes at work in spiritual texts, his vast wealth of expressive sound and color are the reasons for the revival of the spiritual on the worldwide concert stage in the late 20th century. Il Bianco e Dolce Cigno. Little is known of the early life of, uh, of Jacques Arcadelt, though analysis of his name suggests a Flemish or origin, hence Arcadelt, and a birth in France, hence Jacques. Still, by his teens, Arcadelt had moved to Italy, known by an account of his work with the composer Philippe Verdelot. Soon after his move, Arcadelt was appointed to the papal chapel at St. Peter's Basilica, and later director of the boys' choir in the Sistine Chapel. His lofty ascent in the ranks of sacred musicians was coupled with an equally exciting exploration of sacred madrigals. Arkadel composed, in fact, several hundred madrigals over at least 20 years. His publications were remarkably popular. Even his first book of madrigals published um, had been reprinted over 30 times. Il Bianco e Dolce Cigno takes us to the great age of Italian madrigal writing in the first half of the 16th century, when Italy is at the very center of European compositional activity, and its cities are filled with the greatest composers from all over the continent. 
It has been widely suggested that the text of this madrigal, which you can find in your program pages, uh, the text of this madrigal intends a barely hidden eroticism. The idea of pleasure of with a thousand deaths of a day must speak about the fulfillment of carnal desire. And I would agree that later Italian madrigals, some of Monteverdi's madrigals, for instance, are rather unshy about their use of the body texts. But I would also suggest that the theme of sexual encounters does not adequately address the presence of the unconsoled swan. It seems more, more than simply a poem about sex itself. The verse seems to offer an argument against the virtues of innocence. Whatever you believe about that, take it for what it's worth, in the form of a swan embodying purity and beauty, yet dying unconsoled. Against the necessity to deprive oneself of the pleasures of desire, using sexual imagery as a metaphor. Simply a veiled, exotic poem, or perhaps a vivid, poignant admonishment to enter the end of life having derived pleasure from all we experience. Wanting memories comes to us from the 20th century and 21st century composer Issei Barnwell, born, um, born and in New York and spending her time now in the nation's capital of Washington, DC. You may know her if you're familiar with this building and, uh, and the UMS series from her work with the group Sweet Honey in the Rock. That's how I got to know her. And I started to fall in love with the African and African-American genres uh, that she was building together um, on the concert stage. Sweet Honey and the Rock is a group of all women who sing the soprano, alto, tenor, and the very bass notes. And Issei Barnwell is often the one singing the bass. The bass starts in wanting memories. Doom, doom. But of course, Issei sings it lower. Doom, 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 doom. Involved is a shaker in the form of shika, 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 shika. But more importantly than that is the story behind it. Dr. Barnwell, after losing her parents, would look at her walls, and her walls were filled with the pictures of her parents and her grandparents and her ancient ancestors dating back generations. And she would consult them, looking for them to tell her how to see beauty in the world through her own eyes. After she had lost them, she, she used to be rocked in the cradle of her arms. She said, you used to hold me till the pains of life were gone. You used to comfort me in times where I needed solace, and now I need you, and you are gone. The finding for comfort, if ye love me, keep my commandments and I will give you another comforter, that he may bide with you forever in the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth. Today we meditate on a poignant Renaissance motet, one that has popularized itself in the choral world for hundreds and hundreds of years, and hopefully through illuminating the parts of these texts that I find special, you will find um, some new understanding of the setting of these texts that I have come to love and that I have come to appreciate, and that the Arts Chorale has come to prepare with diligence and to love so dearly. Thank you very much. I will look forward to seeing you in just a few moments.